Hi everyone, I'm Mats Lidell. I'm going to talk about my journey writing test cases for GNU hyperbole and what I learned on the way. So, <clears throat> why write tests for GNU hyperbole? There is some background. I'm the co-maintainer of GNU hyperbole together with Bob Weiner. Uh, Bob is the author of the package. The package is available through the AMAX Package Manager and GNU Elpa, if you would want to try it out. Uh, <clears throat> the package has some age. I think it dates back to the first release around 1993, which is also when I got in contact with the, co with the package first time. Uh, I was a user of the package for many years. Later, I became the maintainer of the package for the FSF. <clears throat> and that was although I did not have much knowledge of Emacs Lisp and I do still not <coughs> I still have a lot to learn. Uh, a few years ago we started to work actively on the package with setting up goals and having meetings. So uh, my starting point is that I had experience with test automation from uh, development in C++, Java and Python using different uh, XUnit frameworks like CppUnit, JGUnit. Um, that was in my daytime work uh, where the technique of using pull requests with changes backed up by tests were the daily routine. Uh, it was really a requirement for a change to go in to have supporting test cases. I believe a quite common setup and requirement these days. I also have been a <clears throat> Emacs user for many years, but with focus on being a user. So as I mentioned, I had the limited Emacs Lisp knowledge. So when we decided to start to work actively on hyperbole again, it was natural for me to look into raising the quality by adding unit tests. This also goes hand in hand with running this regularly as part of a build process. All in all, following the current best practice of software development. Uh, but uh, since hyperbole had no tests at all, it would not be enough just to add tests for new or changed functionality. We wanted to add it even broader, ideally everywhere. So work started with adding tests here and there based on our gut feeling where it would be most useful. This work is still ongoing. So this is where my journey starts with uh, much functionality to test, no knowledge of what testing frameworks existed and not really knowing a lot about Emacs Lisp at all. Luckily there is a package for writing tests in Emacs. It is called ERT, Emacs Lisp Regression Testing. It contains both support for defining tests around them. Defining a test is done with the macro ERT def test. In the simplest form, a test has a name, a doc string, and a body. A doc string is where you typically can give a detailed description of the test and has space for more info than what can be given in the test name. So the body is where all the interesting things happen. This here you prepare the test, run it, and verify the outcome. Schematically, it looks like this. You have the ERT dev test, you have the test name, <coughs> and uh, the doc string, and then the body. So it is in the body where everything interesting happens. The test is prepared, the function of the test is executed, and the outcome of the test is evaluated. Did the test succeed or not? The verification of a test is performed with one or more so-called assertions. And in the RT, they are implemented with uh, a macro should, together with a set of related macros. Should takes a form as argument, and if the form evaluates the nil, the test has failed. So let's look at an example. Uh, this simple test verifies that the function plus can add the numbers 2 and 3 and get the result 5. So now we have defined a test case. How do we run it? 
The ERT package has the function or rather convenience alias ERT. It takes a test selector. The test name works as a selector for running just one test. So here we have the example uh, and uh, let's let's just evaluate it. We defined it and then we run then we run it using ERT. As you see, we get prompted with uh, for a test selector, but we only have one test case uh, defined at the moment, so it's the example zero. So let's hit return. <clears throat> and uh, as you see here, we get some output describing what we have just done. There's one test case, it has passed, uh, zero failed, zero skipped, total one of one test case and some some time stamps for the execution. <clears throat> you also see this green mark here uh, indicating one test case and it was and that it was successful. Uh, for inspecting the test, we can hit the letter L, uh, which shows all the should forms that was executed during this test case. So here we see that we have the should, one should <coughs> executed, and we see the form uh, equals to two, and it was uh, five equals to five. So uh, a good example of a successful test case. So now we've seen how we can run a test case. Uh, can we debug it? Yes. For debugging a test case, the RT def test can be set up using the debug defund, just as a function or macro is set up or instrumented for debugging. Let's so let's try that. So. We try e debug the fun here. So now it's instrumented for debugging. Then we run it, ERT. And we're inside the, <coughs> the debugger and we can expect here what's happening. Step through it. And yes, it succeeded just as before. It's time for a commercial break. Hyperbole itself can help with running tests and also help with running them in debug mode. Uh, that is because Hyperbole identifies the ART def test as an implicit button. An implicit button is basically a string or pattern that Hyperbole has assigned some meaning to. For the string ART def test, it is around the test case. So you activate the button with the action key. The standard binding is the middle mouse button or from the keyboard meta return. So uh, let's try that. So we move the cursor here and then we type meta return and uh, boom, the text case was executed. And to run it in debug, to run it in debug mode, we type Ctrl U, meta return to get the assist key, and then we're in the debugger. So that's pretty useful and convenient. A related useful feature here is the step in functionality bound to the letter I in debug mode. It allows you to step into a function and continue debugging from there. For the cases where your test does not do what you want, looking at what happens in the function of the test can be really useful. Let's try that with another example. So here we have <coughs> uh, two uh, helper functions, one f, one add, that used the built-in plus function, and then we have my add that uses that function. So we're going to test my add. And then let's run this 
uh, let's run this using hyperbole in debug mode control u meta return uh, so we're in debugger again and uh, let's step up front to my function on the test and then press i for getting it instrumented and going into it for debugging and here we can expect that it's getting the arguments one and three and it just turns the result four as expected and yes of course our test case will then succeed The next tool in our toolbox is mocking. Mocking is needed when we want to simulate the response from a function used by the function on the test. That is <coughs> the implementation of the function. This could be for various reasons. One example could be because it would be hard or impossible <coughs> in the test setup to get the behavior you want to test for, like an external error case. But the mock can also be used to verify that the function is called with a specific argument. We can view it as a way to isolate the function on the test from its dependencies. So in order to test the function in isolation, we need to cut out any dependencies to external behavior. Most obvious would be dependencies to external resources, such as web pages. As an example, hyperbole contains functionality to link you to social media resources and other resources on the net. Tests and that will require the test system to be called out to the system <coughs> to the social media resources and would depend on it being available, etc. Nothing technically stops the test case to depend on the external resources, but would, <coughs> if nothing else, be flaky or slow. It could be part of an end to end suite where we want to test that it works all the way. In this case, we want to look at the isolated case that can be run with no dependency on external resources. What you want to do is to replace the function with a mock that behaves as the real function would do. The package I have found and have used for mocking is elmock. <clears throat> the workhorse in this package is the with, mac with mock macro. It looks like this with mock followed by a body. In the execution of the body, stubs and mocks defined in the body is expected. Let's look at some examples to make that clear. <coughs> so in this case, we have the macro with mock. It works so that the expression stub plus equal angle bracket 10 is interpreted so that the function plus will re be replaced with the stub. The stub will return 10 regardless of how it is called. Note that the stub function does not have to be called at this level, but could be called at any level in the call chain. So by knowing how the function on the test is implemented and how the implementation works, you can find functions, calls you want to mock to force certain behavior that you want to test, or to avoid calls to external resources, slow calls, etc. Simply isolate the function on the test and simulate its environment. Mock is a little bit more sophisticated and depends on the arguments that the mock function is called with. For more precise, it is checked <coughs> after the with mock clause that the arguments match the arguments it was called with or even if it was called at all. So that it is called with other arguments, there will be an error. And if it's not called, it is also an error. So this way we are sure that the function we were expected to be called actually was called, an important piece of the testing. So we are sure that the mock we have provided actually is triggered by the test case. So, so here we have an example of uh, a with mock uh, where uh, <coughs> a with mock with the mock where where the f at f one add function is mock so that if it's called with two and three as arguments it will return ten. Then we have the test case where we try the my add function, as you might remember, and call that bit two or three and see that it should also then return 10 because it's using f1 add. So moving over to CL let f. In rare occasions, the limitations of EL mock means you could want to implement the full fledged function to be used on the test. <coughs> Then the macro CL let f can be useful. However, you need to handle the case yourself if the function was not called. 
looking through the test cases where I have used CLFF, I think most can be implemented using plain mocking. Cases left is where the, the args to the mock might be different due to environment issues. In that case, a static mock will not work. Another trick is that functions that uses uh, hooks, <coughs> you can, you, you can uh, overload or replace the hooks to do the testing. So you can use the hook function just to do the verification rather than to do anything useful in the hook. Also here you need to be careful to make sure your test handler is called and nothing else. So far we have been talking about testing what the function returns. In the best of worlds we have a pure function that only depends on its arguments and produces no side effects. Many operations produce side effects or operate on the contents of buffers, such as writing a message in the message buffer, change the state of a buffer, move point, etc. Hyperbole is not an exception, quite the contrary. Much of the functions creating links are just about uh, updating buffers. This poses uh, a special problem for tests. The test gets longer since you need to create buffers and files and initialize the contents. Verifying the outcome becomes tricky since you need to make sure you look at the right place. At the end of the test you need to clean up both for not leaving a lot of garbage or buffers and files around and even worse, not cause later the tests to depend on the leftovers from the other tests. Here are some functions and variables I found useful for this. So, so for creating tests, the with temp buffer, uh, it provides you a temp buffer that you visit and afterwards there is no need to clean up. So this is the first choice if that is all you need. Make temp file. If you need a file, this is the function to use. It creates a temp file or a directory. The file can be filled with initial contents. This needs to be cleaned up after a test. Moving on to verifying and debugging. Uh, buffer string. It returns the full contents of the buffer as a string. That can sound a bit voluminous, but since tests are normally small, that is often works well. I have in particular found good use of comparing the contents of buffers with the empty string. That would give an error, but as we have seen with the output produced by the should assertion, this is almost like a print statement and can be compared with the good old technique of debugging with print statements. There might be other ways to do the same as we saw with debugging. Buffer name. Uh, getting the buffer name is good to verify that what buffer we are looking at. I often found it useful to check that my assumptions on what buffer I'm acting on is correct by adding should clauses in the middle of the test execution or after preparing the test input. Sometimes Emacs has switch buffers in strange ways, maybe because the test cause is badly written and making sure your assumptions are correct is a good sanity check. <coughs> Even the ERT package does some buffer and Windows manipulation for its reporting. But I have not fully learned how to master, so a search for checking the sanity of the test is good. Finally, major mode. Verify the buffer has the proper mode. Can also be very useful. And it's a good sanity check. Finally, cleaning up. Unwind protect. The tool for cleaning up is the unwind protect form, which ensures <clears throat> that the unwind forms always are executed regardless of the outcome of the body. So if your test fails, you are sure the cleanup is executed. Let's look at unwind protect together with the temporary file example. Uh, a many test looks like this. You create uh, some resource, you <coughs> call unwind protect, you do the test, and then afterwards you do a cleanup. Uh, the cleanup for a file and a buffer is so common, I have created a helper for that. It looks like this. <coughs> the trick with the buffer modified flag. 
is to avoid getting prompted for killing a buffer that is not saved. The test buffers are often in a state where they have not been saved, but modified. <coughs> Another problem for tests are input. In the middle of execution, a function might want to have some interaction with the user. Testing this poses a problem, not only that the input matters, but also as how <coughs> even to get the test case to recognize the input. Ideally, the tests are run in batch mode, which in some sense means no user interaction. And in batch mode, there is no event loop running. Fortunately, there is a package with simulated input that gets you us around these issues. So this is a macro that allows us to define a set of characters that will be read by the function of the test, and all of this works in batch mode. It looks like this. So we have with simulated input and then a string of characters <coughs> and then a body. The form takes a string of keys and runs the test of the body. And if there are input required, it is picked from the string of keys. In our example, the read string call will read up until ret, RAT or RET and then return the cars read. <coughs> As you see in the example, space needs to be provided by the string SPC as returned by the string RAT. So now we have seen ways to create test cases and even make it possible to run some of them that has IO in batch mode. But the initial goal was to run them all at once, so how do we do that? Let's go back to the RT command. <clears throat> it prompts for a test selector. If we give it the selector T, it will run all tests we have currently defined. So let's try that with the subset of the hyperbole tests. So here is the test folder in the hyperbole <coughs> directors. And uh, let's go up here and uh, load all the demo tests. And then try to run the LT. So now we see that we have a bunch of, of test cases. We can all run them individually, but we can can run with T instead, we will run them all at once. So now, ERT is execution of all our test cases. So here we have a nice green <coughs> display with all the test cases. So uh, that was fine, but we were still running it manually by calling RT. <clears throat> How could we run it from the command line? So uh, <clears throat> RT comes with functions for running it in batch mode. For our purple, we use make for repetitive tasks. So we have a make target that uses the RT batch functionality. And this is the line from the make file. So this is a bit detailed, but you see that we have a part here where we load the test dependencies for getting the packages such as ELMOC and simulated input, etc. loaded. And we also have, yeah, also want to point out here the call to or the setting of how to save default uh, to nil uh, to get away with the prompt for excessive backup files that can pile up after running the tests a few times. Even with the help of simulated input, not all tests can be run in batch mode. They would simply not work there and has to be run in an interactive Emacs with a running event loop. One trick still to be able to use batch mode for automation is to put the guard at the top of each test case as the first thing to be executed so that it kicks in before anything else and stops Emacs to try to run the test case. Now, it looks like this, skip unless not non-interactive. So when ERT sees that the test should be skipped, it skips it and makes a note of that so you will see how many tests that have been skipped. So, so too bad. We have a number of test cases defined and to run them, we need to run them manually. Well, sort of. <coughs> not being able to run all tests is this a bit counterproductive. Uh, 
since our goal is to run all, all tests. There is, however, a no ART function to run tests in batch mode with an interactive Emacs. The closest I have got is either to start Emacs from the command line, calling the ART function as we just have seen, and then killing it manually when done, <coughs> or add a function to extract the contents of the ERT buffer when done and echo it to standard output. So this is how it looks uh, in the make file to get the behavior of uh, cutting and paste or getting the ERT output into a file so we can then now kill Emacs and then uh, spit out the, uh, the content of the ERT buffer. Uh, one final word here is that uh, <clears throat> when you run this in uh, like a continuous integration pipeline, you might not have a TTY for uh, getting Emacs to start. Um, and uh, that is then another problem with getting in the interactive mode. So we have reached the end of the talk. If you have a new, any new ideas, or I have some suggestions for improvements, feel free to reach out because I'm still on the learning curve of writing how to write good test cases. If you look at the test cases we have in Hyperbole and you think they might contradict what I'm saying here, it is okay. It is probably right. Uh, I have changed the style as I go and we have not yet refactored old tests to benefit from new designs. That is also the beauty of the test case. As long as it serves its purpose, it is not terrible if it's not optimal or not having the best style. And yes, thanks for listening. Bye.